Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our study of revival, real, real revival. Um, we're basically working out of the book of Nehemiah, and that's where we'll be again today, starting in the fourth chapter. Um, we've done, this will be our fourth fourth week in this. Maybe the conclusion, maybe, maybe it is, maybe, maybe it, it isn't. <laughs> we'll see how the Spirit of God leads. Um, but before we start, and I, I, I do want to mention two things. First of all, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make about this, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. And the other comment is that the previous three studies and this one will be up on our website and stay up on the website. So if you've missed anything or you want to encourage others to go watch it, they will be there on the Bible Talk website, www.bibletalk.com. That's the end of our advertisements. Now <laughs> on to the show here, program, the work, hallelujah. The study. So, Mark, you'll ask God's blessing on our time in his word, and then we'll get right into it. Well, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Open up our minds and our hearts so we can see what you have in store for us today. And we just bless your name. Amen. Yes, we do, Lord. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. You are our God, and we are your people. And we appreciate that, Lord. Revive us again, oh right. Lord. Revive us again, amen. So Nehemiah chapter 4, and we had left off last week uh, in verse 17, and I just want to read that again, right? Mm -hmm. Those who were rebuilding the wall and all those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. And I had mentioned that it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 2, that the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve table. No matter what you're doing, and this is how he ended, you cannot neglect the word, right? Whether you are a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, you need to be abiding in the word. And it's not a matter of being, you know, what your title of your ministry is. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you better be in the word, all right? said, if you, in John chapter 8, he said, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You need to be free. And that's being ready in season and out also. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is the sword of the Lord, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a weapon. And you've got to take your weapon to work. I don't want to get too far distracted, but I said on a number of occasions, I've had the opportunity, or Alice and I have had the opportunity, um, I can't tell you how many times and how many places we've been asked if we have weapons. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a very common thing. You can't take a weapon onto an aircraft. You can't take an, uh, a weapon into uh, any government, government building. Or, yeah. And they'll, they'll ask, you know, do you have any weapons? And I always say yes. I've not run into any particular problems because of that yet. I've had some very exciting times because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Because we get to share about the word of the Lord, that's the right. sword of the Lord. Never go to work without your sword. Never. I had ended last week, and I had mentioned the fact mm -hmm. that back in the late 70s, late 1970s, um, I, I was a pastor of a small church in a suburb of New York City, right outside New York City. And at the same time, I was going into Manhattan very on a regular basis to minister on the streets of mm -hmm. Times Square back in the day when back Times Square day. was uh, different. Very different. Yeah. But I wound up, and I felt led of the Lord to go take a, a job. And I wound up going and applying for a job uh, as a salesman in a telecommunications company. And I interviewed with the president, and he hired me to be the national sales manager, which was uh, cool. Mm -hmm. And I wound up doing all of the training for the sales staff out of the book of Proverbs. And it was really, really exciting. And through this, and it's not that I was preaching at people, but I was sharing the Word of God, because I promise you that the Word of God is profitable for all things. Peter says, you know, we've been given, it's pertain, the Word of God is, pertains to life and godliness. Right. And it's a fact that that was the best sales training I could do was from the Word. The wisdom from Solomon. Yes. And of course, what happened was that, you know, I, as, as I want to do, I would share the gospel with people. You know, 
it's not a matter of getting in people's faces. It's not a matter. It's a matter you see opportunity because because of the need you see in people. Mm -hmm. They're always in desperate need. There's so much need. People are, people are in need. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. He came for her to bring joy. So, yeah, I share the gospel. Well, I got to tell you something. I was I was there for a couple of years. It was like going to revival every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had I had employees getting saved. I had customers getting saved. Mm -hmm. It was phenomenal. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. And people were getting so excited about the word and the things that they saw God do in the workplace when they put him first in the workplace. You know, I, I, you know, we work nine to five. Well, the fact is, if you know anything about business in New York, it was like at, at, at five minutes to five, everybody's sitting there watching the clock tick away so they get up and jump and run away at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. I had to chase people out. I had to chase employees out. Because at five o'clock, they'd want to sit around and talk about the things that God had done in their lives at work during that day. They had testimonies. They had testimonies. <laughs> it was phenomenal. It was great. It was evangelism and it was revival. Mm, it was exciting. And you know what? In the first year I was there, we increased the sales of that company by 300%. Did it take away from anything? Oh, my goodness gracious, no. Oh, my goodness gracious, no. You have to be led by the Spirit of God. But yes, you can't turn your Christianity off when you walk through the door of your office. You can't do that. Not and be faithful to the Lord. When you bring the word into work, you get wonderful results. <laughs> you, it, it's incredible. And as I say, it was truly, truly an exciting time. As a matter of fact, that actually led to years later when after we had come back from uh, Central America as mm -hmm. missionaries, uh, Alice and I and another couple who had been elders in the church in, in Florida, Central Florida, uh, we started a ministry called the M.D. Solomon Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Randy and Ellen Drake. That was the D. It was I, Alice and I were the M, and he, they were the D. But Solomon got top building because most of it came from Proverbs. Mm -hmm. And wh that's what we did is we did training from the Word of God for business and I did business seminars. Mm -hmm. We did these business seminars. We did them in churches. We did them we did them on cruise ships and mm -hmm. we did them in Europe. We did them in England. We did them in you know all across the United States. And the fact was it was so exciting. It was so magnificent. It really was. Not only for saved people. I mean I had the opportunity to do these seminars for secular corporations. Right. But I would always start by saying that everything that I teach comes from my favorite book. And I'd say that was my the M.D. Solomon Employee Handbook, and it was which was available in the King James Version or the New American Standard, because it was the Bible. I mean, it was just the Bible. And and I would say to people, listen, if, you know, if you wanted to get real good training from somebody who's so well known and successful in the business world, you might listen to Bill Gates, mm -hmm. or you might listen to Warren Buffett. I mean, these guys have written books about it. I said, well, this, what I'm sharing with you comes from Solomon, who was the wisest and richest man there ever was. Or would ever be. Or would ever be. That's right. I mean, don't reject the Bible because you just think, well, you know, they're just trying to convert me. Well, you know, God does the converting, not me. Right. But I could share the things from there. As a matter of fact, let me just read you from, from the website that we had, what we had as a mission statement to equip and encourage Christians to live a holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and holy, H-O-L-Y, integrated life, a life in which a person's business life was not separated from his or her spiritual life, family life from workplace life, and church life from daily life. Our goal is to teach the best practices in all walks of life, as defined by Scripture, to achieve excellence in all that walks of life. I want to tell you something. We saw... Incredible thing. I, I do these two-day seminars, and I would say to people, this is not a religious seminar. Mm -hmm. This is a business seminar. A lot of people got saved. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people That's got true. excited. Yeah, true. Because the power was in the Word, all right? Amen. So let me just go back on the verse 17, all right? Why do you have to have that weapon? Why do you have to have it? Well, in, in verse 7, it had said, now it came about when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites and the Ashabites heard that the repair of the walls in Jerusalem went on, 
and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. You stir up the enemy. When, when Satan sees God at work in your life, he's going to get angry. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he has hate. He's filled with rage and hate. He doesn't have any love whatsoever in him. He doesn't want the work of the Lord to be complete. He does not want to see the work of the Lord. No. So he'll rage against it. And by the way, you know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it talks about in the perilous last days, in the last days, perilous times will come. That word, it literally, I mean, has to do with demonic rage. Yes. So we're living in an age when demonic rage is increasing. And that's what it is. It's rage. Yes. The people of God had a mind to work. Mm -hmm. That's what it said in verse 6, right? Mm -hmm. But the enemy fueled by that anger, had a mind to stop the work. Right, right. And as always, or as usual, the, sep the serpent is subtle. That was the first revelation of the devil in the Bible. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field, right, in Genesis? That's right. So it says in verse 11, mm -hmm. Nehemiah verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them and kill them and put a stop to the work. Sneak attack? Sneak attack. But I have to tell you something. It's only a sneak attack to those who aren't paying attention. Right. Awake, awake, O Israel. I'm telling you, you, you got to be on guard, right? And that, in verse 17, that brought me brought to mind mm -hmm. Gideon and, and those yeah. soldiers. They stood there at or at the ready, or yes, the ready with right, the, yes. the spear, yeah. the word, the but, sword. Yeah, don't don't be surprised. I mean, don't be surprised that he comes against you. You know, he hates you, but it's based on his hate of Jesus, right. right? And that's the weapon we have against Satan is the word. That's what Jesus. That's used. that's actually that's the only. You know, we talk about it being faith, but mm -hmm. that that's wrapped up in the word. Okay? Absolutely. So you know that's why Peter said in, in chapter three, verse seventeen of his second letter. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, right. lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. You've got to be on guard. Where is that, man? Second Peter 3.17. And it's, that's what Peter wrote, but Paul, and I'm sure you know this, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, the Ephesians, Ephesians 6.11, Put on the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, the wiles of the devil. Mm -hmm. He's going to come against you. Don't, don't be surprised, all right? That's a fiery ordeal that comes against you for your testing. But you have to be prepared. I, I have a book in progress. It's been in progress for quite a while. It's going to be my opus hmm. called The Schemes of the Devil. And I say there are three things that I take note of that are the principal tools of the devil against the people of God and the works of God. He wants to divide us, distract us, and disarm us. Okay? And you'll see all the things he does will fit into one of those three categories, right? So here, Satan wants to disarm us. He, he doesn't want you to have that weapon. He fears that weapon. Yes. You know, he had an encounter. When Jesus started his public ministry, he was led by the Spirit of God out into the wilderness where Satan attacked him, right? Mm -hmm. With the temptation. Yes. How many times did Jesus say, it is written? That's right. The word he brought. The Every word. time. That's how often. Every, everything. That's why Satan knows that that's how the power of the word of God against mm -hmm. him, right? All right. This is a study about revival. So I just want to keep moving and t touching on things. Right. So... In, in chapter 5, we're going to move along there for a minute, because if the devil can't win by direct attack, mm -hmm. he will always have a plan to cause confusion in the ranks, mm -hmm. right? Chaos. It, because he's subtle, right? Now, in verse 5, chap in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now there was a great outcry of the people, this is the people of God, right? Mm -hmm. And their wives against the Jew their Jewish brothers. What did I just say? The first principle... Of the schemes of the devil is division. Yes. Divide. Okay. There was a uh, cartoon character back, gosh, many, many, many years ago that I used to read as a, a young man or a kid. It was called Pogo. Mm -hmm. a little swamp possum was what it was. And his friend Ali, the gator, alligator. And there's a, I can remember one which became a very famous one actually. 
they're on, on this their little paddle boat or going through the swamp. And Pogo looks around at, at the situation and he says, we have met the enemy and he is us. Because the swamp was polluted. Polluted. But let me just tell you something. And if you don't know this, write it down. Satan has been defeated. Yes, absolutely. He has no power over you. Amen. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. He doesn't have, so what he has to do is he, he comes to, to kill, but he comes to steal. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your, he wants to steal all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. But he can't. He can't bonk you over the head and take it. Well, he's a he's a thief, but he's a con man. Mm -hmm. He literally has to talk you into giving it up. He has to talk you into giving it up. He can threaten you, but he can't take it from you. You've got to give it away. Right? Absolutely. That's really, really important. It's like Madoff. The greatest thief in our times was Bernie Madoff. Yeah. All right? He, he wasn't, you know, This he, he's in New York City. People are afraid to walk through New York City sometimes because they're afraid somebody's going to bonk them on the head and wow. take their cash out of their pocket. Bernie Madoff stole literally billions, billions of dollars, even so much money from many, many Christian ministries. That's right. All he did was talk them out of it. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Okay. Satan was defeated here. Because of the good leadership of Nehemiah, mm. all right? Mm -hmm. Because Nehemiah loved the Lord and the people enough to boldly confront them and speak the truth in love. Right. Nehemiah called them to repentance and like John the Baptist to bear fruit in keeping with their, accordance to their repentance, mm -hmm. to take action confirming their repentance. He did not take special privileges they were not available to the people. He didn't take, Nehemiah didn't take special. He was one of the people, period. He didn't lay burdens on the people. These are all from chapter 5, right? He did the same work as the people. That's what it says in verse 16 of chapter 5. We, we need good leadership in the church. I think so much of the church today, and this is the reason that we're in desperate need of revival, is the leadership has forgotten that Jesus is teaching about leadership, right? And they have no fear of God. Well, let me just read from Mark. Mark 10, I'm going to read verses 42 to 45. This is Jesus instructing people on leadership. Calling them, his disciples, to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm, I want to address, if you're a pastor or you know, you're in ministry, leadership, in leadership yeah. you're there to serve. I, you know, the apostles, think about this. On the last time that he had fellowship with the apostles, the last time he had fellowship was at the Last Supper. Yes. And Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory, got down on his knees and did what a servant would do. Yes. He washed the feet of his disciples. You know what Peter's reaction was? No, 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 no. Jesus said, if I don't do this to you, you've you got no part. That's right. So Peter said, you know, watch me. Uh, Peter was all right. You're, you're a little <laughs> impetuous. But what did Jesus say? I do this as an example for you. And it's not a ceremony to show how humble you are. No, not at all. You know, it's a heart. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. And it's a desire to serve, to be used. Because that's, what, that's the imitation of Jesus. That's the imitation of Jesus, mm -hmm. is to serve. And that's the kind of thing that starts revival going. That's a spark that will start revival. Yes. When people see Christ in you. I'm going to move right along now to chapter 6, all right? Okay. 
I want to read verses 1 to 3 in chapter 6. Now it came about when it was reported to Sambalat, to Bayat, to Geshem, the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Jephirim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messages to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I have while I leave it and come down to you? Distraction. Yes. Division, distraction, and disarmament. Those three things are right here mm. in this letter from uh, this book of Nehemiah. Right? We have to have I, I did a study that I really, really love on uh, Rocky. Mm. Rocky three. Okay, I'm not going to go into the whole story about that. Bump it up. Because yeah, uh, Alice and I had not gone to a movie for years and years and years, and we were ministering. I was teaching Bible studies out in Hollywood to people involved in the movie industry. And Rocky Three had just come out. And that was the big deal, and they're all talking about that. And so they wanted us to go, let's all go as a group. And I, you know, I, I, that was, I was not enthusiastic about that. But we went to the movie, and I sat there through that movie, and I promise you, God spoke to me through every frame of that movie. Mm. It's a parable. It's yes. a parable about the state of the church today. The eye of the tiger is one of the things that was in there. The eye of the tiger. Now, you know, we lived in Belize, down in the jungle. We've, I spent a lot of time in, in the bush, in mm -hmm. Central America, other places. And in Central America, they have jaguars. Now, down there, the people call them tigers, right? right. I don't know much, but I know this. Mm -hmm. If you're walking through a trail in the bush, and you happen upon a tiger, and that tiger looks at you and says, lunch. You know what? You're a lunch. <laughs> not going to start chasing you and be distracted looking no, at no. the latest fashions in the jungle. No. Once he fixes his eyes on you, it's done. They have beautiful eyes. I mean, yes, they do. that's why people paint pictures of tigers. Is they have this beautiful look. Eyes. But when they, fix, when they get their eyes fixed on you, they're not going to be distracted. Not at all. We are commanded in Hebrews, fix our right. eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our Don't faith. Let like, Don't let anything distract you. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay. He's not a, Nehemiah is not a prophet of doom, but he's bringing a warning from God. Yes. Now, is a warning of God or a distraction from the enemy? In Verse 10 of chapter 6, it says, And when I entered the house of Shemaliah, the son of Deliah, son of Methabel, Methabedal, yeah, who was confined at home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you, and they're coming to kill you at night. In now, the dark. Yeah, but so now, is this a, a, something that the enemy is using to try and distract him or is it a warning from God? Because in verse 12 and 13 it says, Then I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Hmm. He was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly and sin, wow. so that they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. You have to have the witness wow. of the Holy Spirit. You have to be able to perceive. You have to be able to discern What's true and what's not? Okay? You know, I'm going to talk about we lived in Belize. We lived in a little village uh, out, out in the bush. And we had been there for quite some time. We knew the, all the villagers. We used to have services in, and just in the fields. And, uh, you know, we'd have oftentimes as many chickens and dogs as human beings. Mm. Um, but one day, and it's they have a rainy season. It's, they have a dry season for four months and a rainy season for eight months. And we had a little uh, trailer there. And, you know, by this time we had built a little compound. We, we had fixed our place up a little bit. And God spoke to me. I, one day I, I woke up and I heard the voice of the Lord. And he said to me, move. Move today. Now, it's interesting because previously we had had friends from the States who had property 
in a, a more developed village. And they had said, if you want to, ever want to move, you know, you're welcome to come here and park, no, park they had here. invited us. Yeah. Yeah. But God spoke to me and said, I want you to move today. So I told Alice, well, we're going to move. We're going to, we're going to pull the trailer and go over there. And she said, well, this is a rainy season. Now. It's a, the height of the rainy season. You know, we may have to get the whole village to come and help pull us out of this, you know, through the mud. Because we're well, That's what you I mean, said. Yeah, because it's not like we are on a road. Mm -hmm. You know, the, for, for us to get to the nearest dirt road, we had to... There's no way we would have yeah. been able to pull that out yeah. by ourselves. So. Well, the fact was, I actually had to get a bunch of guys from the village oh, to help us pull. Mm -hmm. And then we went that night and parked in uh, Fred and Sally's... Uh, Cook House. property. But because it was such a rush and so difficult, we had to leave stuff behind. Mm -hmm. So the next day, we went back to the village to get our stuff and make sure we had said our goodbyes to everybody. And when we got to the village, there were police constables all over the place. I mean, it was a very, very unusual sight, right? Yes. So I said, you know, I, I went up to one, who, who, a guy I knew, uh, Brown, Sergeant Brown, mm -hmm. and uh, Constable Brown, Sergeant Brown. Sergeant, yeah. Yeah. And I said, then what's, what's happening? And he said, well... Two men came into the village last night. Came, came last night. They had escaped from. Prison. They had escaped from prison, and killed a guard escaping from prison, and they went straight to your camp. Straight to our camp. Did God tell me to get out to yes, give me a warning? Yes, He did. How about Joseph and Mary mm -hmm. when an angel of God right. said to leave? That's right. You know, you have to be able to tell. If this is of God or not of God, you have to be able to discern what's going on. Because I, I want to let you know, Satan will do anything he can to distract you from your purpose. But you need to know the voice of God. But Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Yes, yes. You should be able to know when God is speaking to you. And when God speaks to you, act. act. Move. Whatever he says, do move. It. If he says move, move. If he says stay, you stay put. But whatever he says, that's what you need to do. Because that's the only safe place there is. Right. And that's the place of protection in the palm of his hand, in the shelter of the Most High, the shadow of the Almighty, right? In Acts 27, verse 10, Paul said, When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, this is when he's being carted off across the sea from Caesarea Philippi in Israel to Rome to be imprisoned and see the, the Caesar, right? When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. That's the, all of the people on board the ship. I think it were 287 souls or something, about that many. And he said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Acts 27, 9 and 10. He knew perception was the, the Holy Spirit. That's right. The Spirit, those who are being led by the, by the Spirit are the children of God. I promise you that if you are a child of God, He will lead you with His Holy Spirit. There's two conditions. You've got to have your ears open. You've got to be in tune with the Spirit. And once He's spoken to you, you need to act upon what He said. And that's a fact. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you don't lead us to our own, leave us to our own devices to have to lean on our own understanding. But, Lord, that you have promised to lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Help us, Lord, to be attentive to your voice and to act upon what you say in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Well, until next time, God bless you and goodbye. Thank you.